Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that back on. And I just wanna say welcome. Thanks to everybody who's joining us for our next Nature 101 uh, program. And today we're talking all about cicadas, which I'm super excited about. My name is Rachel Felling. I am a naturalist for the Zionsville Parks and Recreation Department. Um, you can find me most of the time at the Zionsville Nature Center, which is now located within the library here in Zionsville, or out on a trail at a program leading, you know, a bird hike or an activity or a summer camp for kids. Lots of fun things. So, um, like I said, we're here to talk about cicadas. And I am so excited about this. I did a big deep dive in the research, getting ready for this. And it's just, I'm super hype about it. So um, I'm gonna keep, I've got everybody muted. Um, go ahead and keep yourselves muted unless you have a question. If you do feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat um, and we will just jump right in. So you've probably heard an awful lot about the impending cicada emergence here in this area. So what I hope to do tonight is give you some more background about what these creatures are, what they're doing. Um, I know a lot of people have some concerns, so I hopefully will help take some of those concerns down, help you understand what you actually might need to be concerned about versus what you don't. And then just give you guys time to ask me questions. I will tell you, I am a naturalist. I know a lot about a lot of things in nature, but I am not an entomologist, right? I, I do not only study insects. So while I know a good bit about these creatures, I am not an all around super duper expert, but I, I will do my best to answer the questions and give you as much info as I possibly can. So, with that, I'm gonna jump into a screen share because a lot of what I'm gonna talk about tonight, I want some good images to go with it so that we can get a really good understanding. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. We'll probably pop in and out of the screen share at different points. Um, the chat for Zoom, for whatever reason, does not always show up for me really well when I'm screen sharing. So I'll try to remember to jump in and check it. But if I don't answer your question right away, I promise I will get to it eventually. Um, so with that, Let's go and let's talk about some stuff. Um, why are we not showing my PowerPoint as an option here? Hmm. There we go. All right. So hopefully you all can see this. I have my um, my cicadas here up on the screen. So. Let's talk about these cicadas. So they're insects. That's number one thing to, to get out there. These are an insect. Um, they, they come out in the summer. We're familiar with our annual cicadas and we'll talk a little bit about the difference. So we have cicadas every single year, okay? They are often called the dog day cicadas. There's actually a whole bunch of different species out there, but we are most familiar with what we refer to as the dog day cicadas. So think hot summertime, you're hearing something up in the trees, the buzzing, those are our dog day cicadas. You've probably found these before. So in the image on the screen, you can see the difference here. We've got these big green guys. These are the annual cicadas. I bet you found these in your yard or out at the parks. You probably found the exoskeletons of the nymphs, which I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. Um, but this year, 2021, is the year for the emergence of our 17-year cicadas. They live a 17-year life cycle. We're gonna go through it in detail in just a minute. But I want you to understand that these are two different things. The cicadas that we see normally in the summer will still be here. But in addition, we're gonna get our 17 year cicadas as well. So the 17 year cicadas, you can see they are, um, they're smaller. They have these red eyes and black body. So the dog day cicadas or our annual cicadas, they are green, they're a little longer, they're a little wider, their faces, their heads are like stout compared to the annual ones. Um, but the size difference isn't huge, it's maybe a half inch difference in size, not a giant difference, but they are two different things. We will still see our annual cicadas 
this summer. They'll probably emerge a little bit later in the summer. They tend to be more later June, mid-June to later June, and then on into July, August. That's why they call them dog days, right? Dog days, cicadas, right? The dog days of summer. Um, so we'll see both of them this year. That's exciting. All right, let's keep going here. So the 17 year cicadas throughout history, they've been coming up every 17 years. This is not the first time. There's a lot of hype about it right now. We're seeing a lot of news stories, a lot of really like clickbait type articles that these are coming out. This is not new though. 17 years ago in 2004, they emerged. Um, I don't know if any of you all lived here in Zionsville in 2004, and if you noticed what it was like then. I did not live in Zionsville then. I lived up in northern Indiana, so I um, can't really speak to what it was like in our area then. I can tell you northern Indiana had a lot less of them, and we'll look at a map of emergences later, and you'll see it's central to southern Indiana is where it's going to be heaviest. Um, I do recall that summer the summer of 2004. Think back to the summer of 2004 and what life was like then, if you can remember it. Um, I was a lot younger and um, let's see, uh, George Bush was president, right? And, you know, life was just a lot different then. Um, and I remember that summer going on a canoe trip at through Turkey Run State Park on Sugar Creek and just being absolutely dive bombed by the 17 year cicadas in our canoe that summer. Like just they're just, they were everywhere. Um, so I can't, I don't know exactly what it'll look like here, but we'll get into that a little bit more late, later. Throughout history though, they've been emerging, right? This image that's on the screen now is pulled from a 1923 image from the Field Museum in Chicago. Um, that was the oldest image I could find. The oldest written record of uh, the periodical cicadas coming out actually comes from the early 1600s recorded by the pilgrims. Were they happening and coming out before that? Sure, yes, this is a, something that's been happening for millennia. And there's some really interesting stories through um, uh, Native American records, which weren't necessarily written records, but oral traditions, oral passed down stories of cicadas emerging um, throughout history. And they were considered a food source and made for a bountiful summer um, for some indigenous cultures. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about cicadas as food in a bit. Um, so there are definitely historical records. This is not a new thing. This has been happening for hundreds of years, thousands of years, these cicadas have been emerging every 17 years. So don't let anybody make you believe it's new. All right, so before we get any further, let's be really clear about what a cicada is and what it is not. A cicada is not a locust. When I was a kid, my dad used the term locust when he was talking about cicadas. He used it, in, and I've heard other people use it interchangeably. Locust, cicada, I didn't know the difference for a long time. Locusts are not cicadas. We don't get locusts here. Locusts are something that are more, um, you hear about them a lot in Africa, um, parts of Asia, and people get afraid when they hear about the cicada emergence and, and if they associate it with locusts because locusts will often come in big swarms and destroy agricultural areas. These cicadas are not gonna do that, okay? They will not do that. They are their own thing. The, there's a couple big differences I want you to notice about the difference between a cicada and a locust that you'll see here in this image. The top image is a locust. It is in the grasshopper family. It looks like a grasshopper. They're bigger usually, but this is, they're two different kinds of creatures, right? Um, the cicadas are stouter, they're more fat, they don't have those legs for jumping, they're going to do more flying, they're not the best flyers, but they can fly, um, they're going to crawl up surfaces, they're not going to jump, but the big difference that I want you to be looking for with these are their mouth parts. So a cicada's mouth part is like a straw, it is designed for sucking because that's what cicadas do they suck sap out of roots of trees. They are not chewing leaves. That, that mouth part, look at it as, you, as it goes down, it's hard to see kind of in that image, but you can see it a little bit even in the original image, comes down like a straw. They are not chewing anything up. 
A locust, on the other hand, has mouth parts made for chewing. If you've ever watched a grasshopper eat a leaf, you'll see this happen. Um, but that is that is a huge difference. You're not these these cicadas are not coming in to eat all of our plants. Okay, doesn't mean there's zero concern for plants. We're going to talk about that a little bit later when we get to that part. But they're not going to just come in and devour the trees and come in like a swarm of locusts. Um, when early European settlers first saw them back in like the 1600s or probably even some before, they thought they were locusts just because of the way they emerged in numbers, but they are not. It is a different thing. So with that, let's keep on moving here. Let's talk about the life cycle of cicada because I think that's really interesting to understand the life cycle of these periodical cicadas so that you can fully appreciate what it is, um, the 17 year lifespan, because it's really kind of incredible and intense to talk about. So we'll start at the top of this image you see here. Um, so the adults are out in the summer, we're going to hear them soon, and we'll talk about their sound more in just a bit. And the adults, they're here to mate, lay eggs, that's their main purpose, okay? So you're gonna hear them before you, or you may see them, but you're also gonna hear them. And so they mate and then the female lays, lays eggs. So in the second image here, number two, you see it says the female saws a crevice in a tree branch and she's gonna pack in about 20 eggs. I'll show you an image in a little bit that'll show you a series of crevices that they're gonna make in these branches. So about 20 eggs in each one, they might lay up to 600 eggs total in the whole season before they're done, okay? About a month and a half to two months later, those eggs are gonna hatch. These tiny little nymphs, babies, baby cicadas are gonna fall out down to the ground, and then they're gonna burrow into the soil and they're going down to the tree roots. What these nymphs do, nymph is, sort, it's a word, it's a little different than larva, but generally the same thing. The baby cicadas, the juvenile cicadas, they're going down under the ground, they find a tree root, they use that sucking mouth part that we talked about and tap into the root and they just suck up tree juices. And they do that for 17 years. They're not dormant for 17 years. They're just simply down on the ground, sucking up that sap, living their life, hanging out underground for 17 years. You'll see on the image here that says 13 or 17. There are 13 year cicadas as well. Um, but what we're going to see this year are 17 year cicadas. So they just have a different life cycle. Some of them emerge at 13. There are even 11 year broods. The brood that we're seeing this summer are 17 year cicadas, okay? So as they're down there sucking on those tree roots for years and years and years, they're going to molt a few times, um, four times in fact. And so what molting means is they shed their exoskeleton and they come out a little bit larger each time. And then eventually when they get to that 17 year mark after they've been down for 17 years, they will use those front legs to dig back up towards the surface of the soil. So um, you might right around now be seeing little holes, about half inch big holes forming in your yard or maybe in some of the parks here around Zionsville. These little lar or these nymphs, they're making their holes, getting ready to emerge. They're not ready yet. We'll talk about what makes them emerge shortly here, um, but they're getting ready. And once they get to the right temperature. That's the big signal is temperature to emerge. They're going to climb out. They're going to molt their exoskeleton. So they're going to shed one last time. And those sheds of the exoskeleton, I think we're all familiar with finding from our annual cicadas yearly. You find the weird little things stuck to the side of a fence or a tree um, where the, the cicada emerged. And then after that last molt, the, they will be full-fledged adults. They'll have their wings. Before that last molt, they do not have wings, and that's what still makes them a juvenile, an, an actual nymph rather than an adult. They'll have their wings, they'll be ready to reproduce, and then they'll start singing, um, and they'll mate, and, you know, um, lay their eggs, and this whole cycle will start over again. So every 17 years that happens in the in-between, they're hanging out underground, just drinking tree sap, not doing much at all. Okay, so that's what we're about to see is this whole emergence happening. 
So let's keep going and let's learn a little bit about what these broods mean because I've used the word brood more than once and I want you to understand that. So there's a few different species of cicadas out there. Most of the cicadas that come out in these big broods are one species. A brood just means one group that are all on that same life cycle. So you may have seen a lot of talk about brood X. That's what we're about to experience here. That is a whole group that are on that same 17 year cycle. So in the yellow on this map, which you see covering most of Indiana, part of Ohio, um, down, this map doesn't show Kentucky, but I've seen stuff from Kentucky down into Tennessee and then out east, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, and parts of Northern Virginia are all gonna see this emergence of 17 year cicadas. The other colors are other brutes. So um, for example, last year in 2020, where you see orange kind of on the border of, what is that, um, Virginia, down through parts of West Virginia, that brood, um, brood nine, because these are Roman numerals, X is the Roman numeral for 10, right? So we're calling it brood X, but it's brood 10. Brood nine emerged down there last year, okay? We're hearing so much hype about brood X, because it is the largest brood by, it, span, it spans a lot of space, but the numbers are the highest. So um, if you look at the key on the, on the right side, um, brood 13 will then emerge in 2024 up into like Northern Illinois, Southern Wisconsin, part of Iowa, maybe a little bit of Indiana, but it won't be as densely populated. So that's what we mean when we're talking about brutes. This is not the entire East Coast. We're just really fortunate to kind of be in the epicenter of it here in Indiana. I mean, look at Indiana on that map. It's very much yellow. <laughs> and then out into the mid-Atlantic area, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Um, and I love this because I also lived in Maryland for years. So like, I feel like I'm just meant to experience cicadas um, in the places that I live. So it's a really cool thing that we're about to see here. All right, so let's um, let's keep moving here and keep talking about the cicadas. And let's talk about the emergence because it's coming soon. We have not had it yet here in Indiana, but it is on its way. So what makes them emerge? How do they know when to come out? First of all, they can tell the cycles of the year due to the changes in the, the chemistry of the sap from the tree. I read about some experiments that scientists did where they kept these cicadas um, in a lab and simulated this, the seasonal changes in sap that would happen. It, you know, the sap changes from um, sugary to less sugary in trees, depending on the season, when it's getting ready to make leaves or drop leaves. Um, and they sped it up. And when they replicated other years in labs, like they replicated two years in over the course of one year, the cicadas emerged. So they are actually counting the years. Somehow scientists aren't incredibly, or aren't totally sure how, but they are counting it. But we know we've got the 17 year mark here. And so how do they know when to come out? Why are they coming out when they do? Because it all happens kind of at once. And the Big key is a soil temperature of 64 degrees. This is not air temperature or even just the ground, the surface. It's down in the soil an inch or two. I could not get the exact depth at, at which soil temperature is measured for this purpose, but it's a soil temperature of 64 degrees. You can kind of calculate this by looking at some running three-day averages. We have not hit a soil temperature of 64 yet. We have had surface temperatures of 64, we've had air temperatures of 64 or higher, but the soil itself is going to stay cooler longer, and we haven't hit it yet. A couple weeks ago, the entomologists, the people who study insects, were kind of predicting we were going to be there right about now, but then we had this cold streak that we're still kind of coming out of, um, so we have not gotten there yet. Looking ahead at the forecast for the next week to two weeks, I really think that we're going to get it probably by the end of next week, maybe the following week we will hit that. So what you see now, though, 
are these holes in the soil. And sometimes if you get lucky, you might find the little nymphs sticking their little faces out. They're kind of just hanging out and waiting. They know it's almost time, but they're not there yet. And what's gonna happen is once we get that soil temperature warmed up and some areas will warm up a little faster than others, depending on tree cover and things like that, they will start to emerge. So let's talk about the numbers. The whole brood X is thought to, we, we're expecting over a trillion cicadas in the state of Indiana, just in the state of Indiana, not even talking about Ohio, Maryland, West Virginia, any of those other places, a trillion cicadas in Indiana. A trillion is a number that is like incomprehensible to me. I don't know how to process that number. So let's break it down. They might come out and look like this. I love this image of a bunch of them crawling up the side of a brick building. One to two million an acre, which breaks down to 25 to 30 cicadas per square foot may emerge. Okay, so square foot, you can think about that, 25 to 30 of them per, per square foot. Will everywhere in central Indiana have this many? No. So how can you kind of guess, oh my gosh, are we about to, to be covered in these things or no? So one of the easiest ways is, was the area covered in them 17 years ago? And you may not know, not all of us, in fact, I would guess that most of us didn't live in our same spot 17 years ago. Some of you may have. So if 17 years ago you were swarmed in cicadas, you're probably gonna be swarmed in cicadas again. If you didn't have any cicadas 17 years ago, you probably won't have any now, unless there were like major reforestation efforts going around nearby you, in which case they're probably gonna slowly sort of inch towards that area. Um, so, you know, when I think about the, the landscape of Zionsville, I've been here for five years and it's changed a lot. I've seen a lot of houses go up, a lot of businesses go up, but it's not like we are um, deforesting areas for most of the building that's happening in our area. Much of it is happening on old farm fields, okay? So for cicadas to prosper during that 17 years underground, we know they need to feed on tree roots, so they need to have access to trees and tree roots. If you are in an area that was previously just farm fields, you're not gonna have the cicadas there. Right, because there weren't trees there. Now there might be some, there might have been some fence rows with trees in them in between those farm fields that have now been transitioned to housing developments and things like that. But so you might have some, but it's not going to be a full on huge emergence. As you travel towards southern Indiana, we tend to see more dense forests. Um, I'm thinking like as I'm driving down towards Bloomington, Columbus more dense forest than you tend to see in set northern to central Indiana. So the cicada emergence down there is probably going to be much, much thicker. Um, I would imagine some of our parklands here in Zionsville, like I'm thinking Starkey Park, Turkey Foot Park, they've got older growth trees, probably going to see a good amount of emergence. Um, I had somebody tell me that the whole east side of Indy was very heavy in them in 2004. So we'll sort of see what's gonna happen. Nobody, you know, I don't know for sure because I wasn't here yeah. and I've talked to a few people, but a lot of people that I know here weren't here 17 years ago. Do you need help? Um, I can tell you, you can look around and see what you see. What do you need? I have seen some of the cicada holes popping up in some of our parks. Um, I was visiting a family member who was in Eco County, a little distance, not long ago, and they definitely had some cicada holes on their property. So um, I would do it at the table with me to have a huge emergence. So we'll sort of see. All right, what else do you need to anticipate as these cicadas start to emerge? Um, sorry, the large numbers, the main thing that, the main reason that the cicadas emerge all at once like this is what we call predator satiation. The idea is it's sort of strength in numbers. They're not gonna overpower their predators, but there's so many of them that come out at once that the animals that eat them are gonna get so full so fast that they won't possibly be able to eat all of them, okay? So 
every animal that eats cicadas, which is a whole lot of them, we're talking birds, reptiles, amphibians, all the small mammals, they're going to have so much food in early summer that you know they're going to do really, really well. And we'll talk about the ripple effects of that in a little bit. But because so many of them eat so many so fast, the rest of the cicadas can go do their thing. Cicadas are clumsy, okay? They are not great flyers. They don't camouflage well. They move kind of slowly. They can't bite or sting. So they don't really have much defense against predators, except for this mass number that appears all at once. So they, they can't possibly be eaten in enough that it's gonna affect their population negatively. Um, so this whole thing, this whole emergence, going to last around six weeks. So from the time that they hit that 64 degree soil temperature key moment to make them come out to when they're done laying their eggs and they've died off, that's going to take about six weeks. Okay. And then they'll be gone. So we're looking at probably mid to late May through about the end of June, we're going to be experiencing this here. All right, let's keep going. Concerns because this is what I get a lot of. I've had a lot of questions. People are really concerned about a few different things. So let's talk about those things. So um, number one are the trees, okay? So when the, when the female cicada lays her eggs, we talked about this a little bit already, right? She saws a tiny hole in a branch and they're not going to the big branches. They're gonna go to the small twigs and they're looking for deciduous trees and shrubs. So trees and shrubs that lose their leaves every year. If you have an evergreen tree, like a pine tree or a fir tree, they're not interested in that. They like the deciduous trees, your maples, oaks, dogwoods, cherries, things like that. They're not too discerning on species as long as it's a deciduous tree. And they're gonna go to those end branches where they have small twigs on the ends and they're gonna drill those little holes and the lay their eggs in it. So a lot of people get really concerned that it's going to hurt their tree. What it's gonna do is it's gonna take the branch and they're going to go into it. And what it'll do is call something called flagging. So they'll eat it up and then it'll, the little piece where they um, dug in will fall off, okay? Um, and they'll get in there and lay their eggs. And um, in that, it'll sort of prune the, the trees naturally. If you have a very young tree, it could potentially be problematic. I will say that I, um, I sat in on a webinar from the Purdue um, Department of Forest and Natural Resources, listened to one of their chief foresters talk about this, and the research shows that even on really young trees, it can cause damage, but the trees generally come back from it. So you don't need to be too freaked out about your trees and bushes. And the only ones that are gonna be mostly affected are the really young ones. So this spring is not the best time to go out and plant trees. Um, if you run an orchard, that's a little different because right, that's your livelihood. So even the young ones, you can't have a couple years where it's off and so, you know, people who are run orchards or nurseries or things like that are taking different precautions. I'm assuming that those of you in on this webinar are probably not in that category. Um, <clears throat> if you did just plant a small tree or bush that maybe you spent some good money on, you're concerned about it, one thing you can do is um, cover it with some netting. So you can purchase netting like this, um, like you see in this image, and put it around the tree, and it can help take care of it, help protect it. It does need to be around the trunk tightly so that the cicadas can't climb up and in. So you can't just drape it over. It needs to go over and then be tied around the bottom so that they can't get in. And the holes need to be smaller than a half inch. So you can buy netting like this usually at, um, you know, your garden centers, big box stores, things like that. I don't know if those, if they are, having less of that in supply because of the emergence that's coming up, but it is something that you can do. But again, the research shows it's basically just a pruning for your tree. Your tree might not look the best for a year or two, um, but the research shows 
they do come back, it's not permanent damage. Remember that these cicadas in these trees have had these relationships for years, millennia, and a little bit of pruning can often be good for a tree. Um, so hopefully that helps quell some of those concerns. If you have questions about it, throw them in the chat and I will do my best to answer them further. All right, what else? The noise, that's another concern. The cicadas are gonna sing really, really loudly um, and they're singing to attract a mate. The males are the ones singing. So the noise hits about a hundred decibels. Now, I don't know how many people really understand what decibels are, um, but they, that is the equivalent to standing next to a motorcycle. And a leaf blower, a lawnmower, about 85 decibels. Okay, so it's louder than a leaf blower or a lawnmower, about as loud as a motorcycle. And it's actually kind of cool how they make their sound. We often think about how crickets make their sound, right? By rubbing their legs together, they make that, that sound. I'm not gonna try to imitate it. Um, but what the cicadas do is a little different. Um, I'm gonna pop out of the screen share for a second, actually, to show you this. Their abdomens of the males, have um, what's called a temple membrane. And it's like this, a bendy straw, okay? So it pops out and then squeezes in. And as it compresses, rubs those things together to make the sound they make. And when they do it fast enough, it sounds kind of like a clicking sound. So you can imitate it with a bendy straw if you wanna get an idea of what that's like. They're not rubbing legs together like a cricket. They're actually, sort of pulling in air and pushing it out through that organ that makes that sound. And again, it's just the males and they're doing it to attract the females. Um, it's all about finding the females. What happens to the cicadas after six weeks? Oh yes, we're getting to that. We're getting to what we're gonna find on the ground, but yes, they do die at the end of the life cycle. So let me pop back into my screen share. Um, so the, the noise is one, um, <laughs> I read that the, it's recommended that you don't expose yourself to sounds of hundred decibels or more for more than 15 minutes. So it is gonna be loud out there once these guys all emerge. Um, maybe not the best time to be planning an outdoor wedding. I read about um, a school, a small college, I can't remember which one it was, a small college in um, Indiana, it wasn't Marion, uh, that's gonna bug me, um, that they moved their graduation ceremony indoors. They were gonna do it outdoors because of COVID, but then somebody remembered how loud the cicadas were at their outdoor uh, graduation ceremony in 2004. So they decided to move it indoors to like an auditorium instead because it's just gonna be that loud. Um, all right, what other concerns? can my pets eat the cicadas? So I should have started off this, this section by saying, first of all, they do not bite, they do not sting, they cannot harm you in any of the ways we think of insects harming us, okay? They're loud, they're gonna harm you by that way, they're gonna be annoying, but they are not gonna bite or sting, they are harmless. So can your pets eat them? <laughs> yeah that's not gonna hurt them. It's probably good protein. Obviously, I'm not a veterinarian. If you have a pet with some special concerns, talk to your veterinarian, um, but it's not gonna, they're not gonna get poisoned. They're not gonna get bit. They're not gonna get stung. All of the animals out in nature are gonna be eating them in mass numbers, right? Think of our birds, our raccoons, possums, um, even the squirrels and things like that that typically don't eat insects will eat them because there's going to be so many. So if your dog eats some, if your cat eats some, it is not the end of the world. Um, they, will, they will be out there. And But one final concern, which was asked in the chat, will there be lots of dead cicadas? Yeah, the answer is yes, there will be. So after they lay their eggs, then they die. That's the end of their life cycle. They're gonna die and when they die, they're gonna fall to the ground. So um, I've read some accounts of people using snow shovels to like scoop them and move them away. Um, I doubt most of us will experience that dense of 
uh, cicada carcasses. It's not impossible, but you know there are plenty of creatures that will still be eating them once they're dead. Um, so that is you know a concern. It's unlikely that it's going to be in mass numbers. It actually their their decaying bodies are going to put a huge amount of nutrients back in the soil. So it's going to help the soil too. So hopefully. I've addressed some of the concerns, okay? But let's talk now that we've talked about the, the concerns. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention now that I'm looking down at my notes. When do they call? We talked about their noise, right? 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. They like the warmer part of the day. That doesn't mean that nobody's gonna be out there singing at 8 a.m. It also doesn't mean that there won't be anybody singing at seven, but that 10 to five, is the hot spot of the day. So, you know, if you need to do something outside and you don't want to deal with their noise, try to do it at the end of the day, later in the day, that's when you're going to have your best opportunity. How long does it take for them to decompose? I don't have an exact answer on that. Um, I would guess within a few weeks, especially in the heat of the summer, it'll be gone. It might get a little stinky and gross for a little bit if you're in a really dense wooded area, um, but it shouldn't be anything terribly bad. Um, all right, let's talk about some of the upsides now that I've spent all this time talking about the things that might you might be concerned about. Why is this cool, right? So one, that predator satiation we talked about, the fact that so many things are gonna eat them. Um, the image that's on the screen now is a copperhead and it's eating one of the annual cicadas. You can see it's green. Everything will eat these cicadas, everything. There's a really awesome clip from one of the um, old Planet Earth episodes narrated by David Attenborough, where they show so, some of the animals after the, a cicada emerges, just kind of sitting around like, because they just can't possibly eat any more. They're gonna be stuffed. It's gonna be like Thanksgiving dinner um, for a few weeks for all of the animals, you know, or like, you know, if you ever go to a buffet and you think, oh man, I'm going to eat all of this, you just stuff yourself. That's what's going to happen in nature because of these cicadas. But that has ripple effects. It's not just going to be great for the animals that directly eat them. Think about this snake, for example. Copperheads, maybe not the best example of this specific thing, but snakes in general eat a lot of bird eggs and young baby birds. So this year, instead of having to crawl up in the tree and fight to get into a nest and work really hard to eat those baby birds, snake's gonna eat a bunch of cicadas and snake's gonna get full eating cicadas. So more baby birds will be able to make it to adulthood and meaning more birds. These kind of ripple effects are gonna happen down the chain, um, but you might also get more predators that do well, right? Like our, uh, our foxes. You know, if the mom fox has all these young cicadas or all these cicadas to feed her babies, maybe more foxes make it. So it may, it'll balance itself out eventually, but it's got really awesome ripple effects throughout the entire um, ecosystem, which is really cool to take a look at. Now, here's the next one that I think is really interesting food. People eat cicadas as food, have for thousands of years. Um, you can eat them. I am not a doctor, I am not a chef, um, so I'm not gonna give you all the advice on how to prepare them. I will tell you that there are some very interesting recipes out there that you can look up if you are into this. Um, if you have any desire to eat cicadas, here's what I'll tell you. For one, they are, they're arthropods. They're, if you're allergic to shellfish, you are likely to have a reaction from eating a cicada or any other insect for that matter. Um, people eat crickets in different parts of the world, grasshoppers. Um, they are all related to crustaceans. You know, so if you're, if you're allergic to shrimp, crab, lobster, you might be allergic to cicadas too. So just exercise that caution. Um, if you're going to eat a cicada or any other insect for that matter, you don't wanna be picking up the dead ones off the ground and eating them because once they're dead and on the ground, they're starting to decompose. There could be different bacteria and things involved that could make you sick. You want to prepare them by taking them live. You put them in a freezer that kills them and then you can prepare them to eat them. So um, you don't wanna eat the legs. You don't wanna eat the wings because those things are difficult to chew and get stuck and just wouldn't be good. Um, how to prepare them? I read a bunch of different stuff. Basically, if you cook a shrimp 
in a certain way, you can cook a cicada that way. So I read about like sauteing them into a pasta. Um, the image that you see on the screen is skewering them like a kebab. That's a possibility. I found a recipe for cicada Bloody Marys where they use them basically as a little garnish like you would a piece of shrimp or bacon. Um, so if anybody chooses to make any kind of cicada meals, I would be very interested to hear about it. Um, I think I'm gonna pass on it, um, but there are some incredible recipes on the internet if this is something you wanna learn more about. Um, <clears throat> I believe at Purdue, Purdue does a bug, a whole bug day every year. I don't think they're doing it in person this year due to COVID, um, but they do like a, a, a bug meal event as part of it. Purdue has one of the biggest entomology part, departments around. So um, during their bug day, they do do a whole thing where they talk about bugs as food. And, and insects make incredible food for people throughout the world. Um, it's a great source of protein and it's often really readily available. So. Um, we have a weird stigma about it in our culture, but we probably shouldn't. All right, one other upside. I love this picture. It's a cool learning experience. If you have kids, I encourage you, even if it's difficult to fight the instinct, try not to be like, ew, or oh my goodness, it's so gross. I don't know. Try to quell that and appreciate that this is a really awesome phenomenon that only happens every 17 years take your kids out, share it with them, teach them about it, let them experience it. Um, if they see you fearful, they see you freaking out about it, they're going to take that on as well. But if we can try to gain some appreciation for these amazing creatures and their really unique and incredible lifestyle, your kids will pick up on that as well. Um, so with that, I would tell you to enjoy what's about to happen this summer. Even if you're a little like, I don't do bugs, I don't think I'm gonna like this. Appreciate the fact that this is not gonna happen again until 2038. So think about how old you'll be 17 years from now. When I did that math in my head, I was, um, I was like, oh my goodness. So the 17 years will go by fast. Um, I know the last 17 did, um, but it's gonna be a long time. If you wanna take it a step further, there's a really, really cool citizen science program out there called Cicada Safari. It's an app that you put on your phone um, and it's operated by Mount St. Joseph's University. And then there's a couple other research institutions involved. You download the app Cicada Safari and what the scientists are trying to do is get a better idea of what this emergence looks like so that they can gain data. So citizen science is what it sounds like. It's the average person, not some researcher from a university or institution, but an average person going out and collecting data that real scientists then use. So if you download Cicada Safari, what happens is I'll show it to you on my phone here. I'll jump out of the screen share. Um, you open it up and it's gonna show you some, oh, the virtual background. It's gonna show you some images that you can look like look at. But the really cool thing is if you see cicadas, they're encouraging you to take pictures and upload them to their database here. I'll show you the map. And then you can look at what is happening around you and where cicadas are emerging. And if you can continue to do this when you see them, it gives the researchers really good information. So again, this app is called Cicada Safari. It's a free app. Um, and you, if I click on this, I can see pictures of what people are finding. So this is an image of a nymph sitting in the soil. It's not quite ready yet. Um, and that's what I see looking all over in the pictures that are in our area. Now, if I move the map south, once I get into Southern Kentucky to Tennessee, they are starting to see the very first of the adults emerging. So um, that will be coming for us probably in the next week to two weeks that we're going to get that too. So think about it. It's a little further south. It's a little warmer down there. They're moving a little faster through the season than we are here in central Indiana, but it's coming. Um, so Cicada Safari, um, if you have kids that would be into it on the 26th, 
7th of the month, which is a Thursday. It's the day after school gets out. We're going to do a cicada safari program of our own that afternoon at Starkey Park. Um, so feel free to sign up for that. We're going to go out for a hike, see if we can find some of these cicadas. We'll upload the pictures that we find to the app so that hopefully we can help contribute to the research. Um, and it'll be a really good time. And we'll talk all about the life cycle and stuff. And that's more, more for the kids. So with that, that's kind of the end of my spiel. I hope I quelled some concerns. I hope I gave you some new information. Who has questions? You can put them in the chat. You can unmute yourself. Is there, I know people probably still have questions. So feel free to ask them. Really? Nobody? Somebody said they downloaded the app. That's awesome. I love it. Um, do it with the kids, take pictures. Um, and, you know, if, if you don't, if you come up with a question that you can't think of, you know, that I didn't cover tonight, um, you can always shoot me an email, send a message to the Zionsville Nature Center's Facebook page, and we'll try to answer it. Um, and we'll go from there. How do they breathe underground is a question that was asked. That is, um, that is a good question that I don't have a full answer to. I will tell you that most um, a whole lot of creatures, especially those that burrow, do not need the level of oxygen that we need. Even if you think about like hibernating turtles and frogs, when they dig under the ground in the winter, they need a lot less oxygen than we do. Um, it's not something that we with the, our body's needs could do, but other creatures can. That's a good question that I don't know all the details to though. So there is still oxygen under the ground though. All right, friends. Well, thank you all so much for joining me. I'll hang out for just a minute here. If anybody has any other questions they want to throw in the chat, I appreciate everybody showing up and uh, happy cicada searching. I can't wait. You know, if you find a good one, post it. I'd love to see them. All right, guys. Thanks so much.